So let's begin. Uh, we want to start with our uh, bodhicitta motivation. But before we do that, uh, in case you don't know me, my name is Ani Pomo, and I am the director and resident teacher of Sung San Gampo Buddhist Center in Lakewood, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cleveland. Normally, we have meditation every Sunday there, but since the pandemic, we are online for our meditation and also classes and um, other things, which I will mention at the end when there's more people here. So um, today, what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, talk a bit about the law of cause and effect. Um, and um, yes, so this is part of the four thoughts that turn the mind towards the Dharma. So um, I will go into that after we uh, say so in Buddhism, we always start uh, the teachings with uh, bodhicitta motivation. So bodhicitta literally means um, awakened mind, heart, the mind and the heart. The definition of it is the wish to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. So um, that means from a practical sense is that everything we do on this path, though it seems like and is um, working on oneself, it's really to be able to attain enlightenment so that we can benefit others to the maximum degree. So um, that's why we set our motivation here uh, for the time we're going to spend together this morning um, with that strong yearning to attain enlightenment for others. Then I just want to uh, remind us of the lineage, our wonderful teachers, so precious to us, uh, Tugu Pema Wangyal Rinpoche, Jigme Kensu Rinpoche, Taku Matu Rinpoche, and others who have been so instrumental in guiding us, teaching us, helping us, and so forth. So we really owe them a great debt of gratitude and uh, respect. <clears throat> All right, so as I said, we are going to talk about karma this morning, um, and it is one of the four thoughts that turn the mind towards the dharma, or sometimes it's called the four mind changes. So what this means is that we are um, often, you know, not so interested <laughs> in practicing, right? We have our habits, we have our ignorance, we cling to things, and there's something in us, you know, there's a habit that we have for many lifetimes of resisting those kind of changes. So um, these four thoughts are meant to make us want to practice. So I've already done two videos on this, so if you're interested in the previous two, um, they're, they're up on our page and you, you can have a look at them. Uh, the first one is Precious Human Life, which outlines, um, you know, which reminds us uh, of the fact that we have a life right now with all the conditions to study and practice the Dharma, which is really, really very difficult to get. So that is a thought that helps us to practice, helps us want to practice because we realize um, it's so hard to get the situations that we, that we to be in this situation, um, to have a life uh, like we currently have. The second uh, of the four mind changes is impermanence. Actually, it's death and impermanence. Death, I guess, is maybe the biggest impermanence that we experience, right? So uh, impermanence helps us in many ways. One is to the main um, reason that we contemplate that in the context of the four thoughts is that uh, we makes us realize, oh yeah, we're going to die. And uh, we don't know when. We all, most of us have this impression, you know, oh, we're going to live very long. We're going to, you know, we're not going to die until we're old and, you know, this kind of thing. But in fact, you never know you actually never know. So we better practice, right? Because it took, it took us so much to get this, um, this precious human life. And if we don't use it, you know, it's like winning a lot, winning, you know, buying a lottery ticket and winning, but not bothering to go and cash the ticket in because it's raining or you're tired or whatever. A lot of excuses that we give for not practicing. So there's a lot more on that, and you can look at the other videos about that. 
I actually have two videos on impermanence and I have another video on karma too. So if you're not satisfied with this one, you can look there. So um, the third uh, thought that the, of the, the third of the four mind changes or the four thoughts or the thoughts that turn the mind towards the Dharma is karma. Okay. So karma is refers to uh, the law of cause and effect. Okay. So karma is a word that has been really misunderstood in our current culture. Uh, people tend to see it as revenge. You know, you see a lot of things on um, social media that's like karma is going to get you and karma is a B word. And, you know, I'm not worried. I hope karma really, you know, right. It's not about revenge. It's not about revenge at all. Also, there's good karma. So let's not forget that. So let me explain first the uh, broad strokes. Okay. So broad strokes, the most basic and simple way of understanding the law of cause and effect is every action brings a reaction. Now, this is really obvious in the physical world, right? Uh, what goes up must come down, you know, every action brings a reaction. There's this, that's obvious, right? But it also applies to our consciousness, okay? So um, negative acts of body, speech, and mind result in suffering. And positive acts of body, speech, and mind result in happiness. So I'm using the words negative and positive. Sometimes people use the word good and bad or virtuous and unvirtuous. But honestly, I really prefer skillful and unskillful, okay? So why? Because karma is not judgment. There isn't anyone in the sky with a book, you know, writing down all the things we do and deciding that we need to be punished or rewarded, okay? It's just considered like a natural law, okay? So uh, I compare it to the law of gravity, okay? So um, let me see something I can drop. Okay, so um, this plastic bowl, okay? If I, the, I'm talking about the law of gravity now, okay? So if I hold this up and I drop it, I'm going to drop it in my skirt. Okay. If I drop it, it just goes down. Okay. Because the law of gravity, what goes up must come down. That's it. I don't need to feel good about that. I don't need to feel virtuous. I don't need to feel guilty. I, that's it. It's impersonal in that sense. Okay. When we are uh, experiencing the karmic effects of things that that we in big quotes have done in this and previous lives um, sometimes people uh, misunderstanding the law of karma um, feel guilty you know oh I'm suffering so much in this life so I must be a bad person it's not about that it's not about that okay yes our suffering is definitely caused according to the Buddha by uh, things that we've done in the past. So the past can be this life uh, or, uh, you know, up to today, right? Or it, and <laughs> it includes all of our previous lives too. So if we're gonna properly understand the law of karma, then we have to take that whole spectrum of time in mind. We have to take that into consideration. Okay, because karma is not limited to just this life. If we think karma is just limited to just this life, we'll be very confused. Okay, um, because then it becomes a big question, right? Which has been a question, you know, for forever for a lot of people, which is why do good people suffer? Why do bad people have really good situations? Uh oh. There we go. Okay. So I think I blanked out there for a second on my computer. Um, so why do good people suffer? Why do um, bad people um, have a good life, right? Well, karma 
you know, you can attribute that to, to whatever you want to attribute it to, okay? But the explanation according to the Buddhist teachings is that um, it's karma, right? So let's take a person, like I knew these, this couple, for example, years ago, who were just almost holy, you know, they were so good, they were so kind, so generous, you know, just wonderful people. Yet uh, their lives were beset by tragedy after tragedy, suffering after suffering. And it was very hard to take, you know, and really the most logical, actually, the most logical explanation for that is karma, okay? So in this life, they might have been perfect angels from the day they were born, right? But due to uh, negative acts done in previous lives, they experience this suffering now. So why is that not blame? Why shouldn't we say, oh, they must be bad people deep down, or they must have been bad people, and so this is why they're suffering? Well, you know, we're talking about, when we talk about many lifetimes, we're talking about a stream of consciousness that has been going through life after life after life from beginningless time. So where do you want to put the finger? You know, where do you want to point the finger? Where do you want to put the so-called blame? You, you can't, you know, this is just an effect. It's a natural effect of some, you know, something, this particular stream of consciousness, which happens to embody this, you know, inhabit this body at this moment, at some time in the past, there were negative acts. And so now I'm suffering, okay? Um, for example, I have chronic back pain, and I've had this pain for more than 20, 22 years now at least, okay, and have tried everything under the sun to fix it, and I'm still trying, and hopefully one day it will work. But if I think of that in terms of karma, I just have to think, you know, I can't remember anything in this life that I would have done that would result in this kind of chronic pain, I was going to say agony, but it's a little bit much. Okay, this kind of chronic pain. So if I think about that in terms of karma, then I have to think, well, at some point in, the, in a past life, I must have, I, in big quotes, and I'll talk about that in a second, okay, um, must have done something, uh, usually physical, uh, you know, acts result in physical comfort or uh, discomfort, okay? Okay. Um, I must have done, or this stream of consciousness must have at some point done something in the past that created the, the, the situation, cause and effect, okay? Karma, the word karma act actually literally means um, action. That's the literal translation of karma. But the way that we use it now, even in Buddhist circles, um, really refers to the whole um, workings, right? The cause and the effect, all right? So if I think of it in those terms, then actually it helps me to accept the pain better, you know, because, okay, I have this physical suffering, but if I add on to that mental suffering, like, why me? Why is this happening? Why am I in so much pain? Why can't I get rid of this pain? You know, we're just adding suffering onto suffering when we think like that, okay? If I think, well, it's my karma, you know, this is something that happened to me. This is something that, you know, this particular stream of consciousness did. And now I'm experiencing this pain. And when my karma, you know, my bad karma, so-called bad karma is purified, I won't have this pain anymore. Until that point, I will have this pain. Okay. And the fact that I've had this pain for 22 years and tried everything I, I know, you know, to fix it, really, in a way, gives me confidence in karma because I'm just like, you know, there has to be a way to fix this. I haven't fixed it yet. I'm hoping this karma runs out soon. Um, uh, and, you know, like I said, I'm still working on it. So when we think of it that way, it just becomes easier to take. It becomes easier to handle, you know. It's not um, that we – sometimes uh, – okay, wait, let me back up. So um, – why we, we don't take it personally really has to do with uh, non-self, okay? 
And what that teaching is about is about emptiness, which you might have um, heard about earlier, and maybe one of these days I'll do a video on that. Um, but it essentially means empty of inherent existence, okay? Um, we have this tendency to, to believe that we are solid, permanent, unchanging, okay? And that everything around us has those same qualities. But as soon as we start to investigate, we see that that's not true, okay? The body's changing every second. The mind is changing every second. Outer environment is changing every second. What are you going to point to, right? and say that is permanent, unchanging, et cetera, okay? Just look at a picture of yourself from 10 or 20 years ago. It becomes very obvious how much you've changed in that amount of time. So there isn't, and I'm being very, very brief, you know, I really need to go into more detail, but we don't have time. Um, so that's why we don't take it personally, because where is the I? Where's the I right now? You know, we say, I exist, I do this, I like that. Where, where is the I? Find it right? We cannot find it. So if we don't exist now, as we perceive ourselves, if we are, in a sense, a verb rather than a noun, um, what are we going to point to to identify me in, you know, three lifetimes ago, must have kicked somebody in the back, and now I have chronic back pain, right? We can't. So we can't take it in one, on one, in one, on one, ah, sorry, on one hand, we can't take it personally, okay? We have to take it like the weather. Like if it, like now today's really hot day, it's in the 90s, I, I have nothing to do with that, okay? I can say, oh, I feel guilty, that must be my bad karma, or I'm, I love the heat, I must be a really good person. It doesn't make any sense, right? So it's the same. It's the same with karma. We have to understand what it is and at the same time, like, not take it personally, which, again, requires a lot more time than we have to fully explain, but that's a, you know, summary, okay? At this, on the other hand, we have to take it seriously, all right? So that taking it seriously really has to do more with right now. Okay, this life. What are we doing? Uh, what kind of acts are we performing with body, speech, and mind? Okay, because those actions, all the actions that we do, cre create a karmic result. So if we want to be happy in this and future lives, then we really want to make a big effort to um, do positive acts of body, speech, and mind. The word they often use is virtuous, virtuous acts of body, speech, and mind. If we want to avoid suffering in this and future lives, then we want to avoid negative acts of body, speech, and mind, okay? So I can't change at this point what I've done in the past, okay? Maybe I kick somebody in the back, like I said, okay? I can't change that. If that's something that this particular stream of consciousness did in a previous life, I can't change that, right? But I can change how I react to that. What do I do with that suffering is what matters right now, is part of the practice right now. So as I said earlier, I can use that pain to recall the law of karma, the law of cause and effect. I'd be like, you know, I really want to be careful with my acts of body right now because I don't want to have more physical suffering in this and future lives, okay? So that means um, any kind of negative act that we do with our body, we want to avoid that, right? Killing, stealing, beating people up, sexual misconduct, you know, all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, so... Uh, if we avoid those things, if we do positive things with our body, serving others, helping, saving lives, this kind of thing, then we create positive karma, okay? And happiness for ourselves uh, in the future. So the law of karma matters and should be taken seriously in that regard, all right? This whole round of samsara, which I will talk about in two weeks' time, uh, is 
so cyclic existence, right? Life after life in many different forms is fueled by karma. So if we want to uh, escape samsara and attain enlightenment and freedom from suffering and you know um, freedom from ignorance, then we really have to take care of our karma, all right? Guru Rinpoche, who um, is considered like the second Buddha, uh, he says, you know, your view should be as high as the sky, but your action should be as fine as flower. Okay, so what does that mean? So when we talk about the view, we're talking about the understanding of emptiness, which again, I said, I, I don't really have time to, to go into very much right now. But um, so your view should be like the absolute, right? The highest view. But if you have this, this view of the emptiness of, of the self, emptiness of all phenomena, that doesn't mean that, that you shouldn't pay attention to your ex. And sometimes people make that mistake, right? They're like, I understand emptiness, I'm a great practitioner, but they don't pay attention to how they act. We cause others suffering when we, when we um, act in negative ways, okay? And we cause ourselves suffering when we have negative thoughts. And that's like really the kicker in Buddhism, we hate that, okay? <laughs> right? Because in, you know, a lot of us were some form of Christianity in the past, and, you know, in Christianity, it seems that it's more your words, your, your actions that matter and not your thoughts, right? But for, for Buddhists, your thoughts actually are paramount, are the most important, okay? Because the mind is the boss. The mind is the motivator of the speech and the action. We don't have, we don't say something without it originating in the mind. We don't do something without it originating in the mind, okay? Except for automatic things like breathing, you know, those sort of functions, but otherwise everything starts in the mind. So we have to work with the mind. We have to take our thoughts seriously, which is honestly very, anyway, for me, it's very difficult. Yeah, I work on it, but it's quite difficult, okay? Uh, but it's very important. So this is how and why uh, meditation is really helpful, which we'll be doing in a few minutes, okay? So why is that meditation helpful in relation to karma? It's because uh, um, we start to understand our mind. We start to, um, you know, work with our emotions uh, and, um, uh, you know, kind of, be more quick to, to catch where our mind is at any given time, right? Because a lot of the, the uh, negative acts that we do um, begin in the mind, but we're not paying attention, right? And suddenly we find ourselves yelling at someone or slapping someone, hopefully not, or, you know, any number of other negative acts that we might do. Okay, because we're not paying attention to what's going on in the mind. So meditation really helps us to get much better at knowing what's happening in the mind, um, like all the time, being very vigilant and watching ourselves and then applying the antidote when we see that we're in, you know, a negative situation. So let's say that we're very, we're, we're, we find ourselves really grasping, um, uh, um, you know, feeling kind of greedy, uh, and this kind of thing. Then we notice that, hey, you know, calm down. It's not really where you want to be. Let's develop generosity instead, okay? Um, and that applies to so many other things. Uh, and I'll talk more about that. We, we do have a seminar this coming weekend. So um, please look on our website uh, or join the newsletter. All that information is below, okay? But we'll be talking, and uh, the title is... Um, Dealing with difficult emotions. <laughs> I think that's the title. Okay. So anyway, we'll be talking a lot about that and doing various meditations during that um, seminar. So please have a look at that. Anyway, um, okay. Another important thing to remember about karma, you know, I was referring to like the law of gravity as an explanation for not doing karma personally. Uh, the other thing that I want to say, there's two more things I want to say in regard to that. 
Uh, one is that um, karma isn't an outside force like gravity. Karma exists uh, in our own consciousness, okay? And um, the other is that karma has no mercy. It's brutal, like the law of gravity, okay? So let me give you an example of that. Let's say you uh, there's a, you know you, somebody lives on a fifth floor apartment and they open the window and they drop a pencil out the window. That pencil falls because of gravity, right? Now, if they have a baby that they're sitting on the on the counter on the I'm sorry windowsill and the baby falls out, the law of gravity doesn't go no that you know just hold the baby up in the middle of the air because it's a baby and suddenly the law of gravity isn't going to work right that baby also falls. I'm sorry to give you a difficult example like that, but I think it really um, gets to the point. We can't finesse karma, just like you can't finesse gravity, right? You can't, you know, wake up one day and go, eh, you know, I really don't feel like experiencing gravity today or pray to the gravity God and say, hey, uh, can I not have so much gravity today? I'm trying to lose weight, you know, <laughs> right? So it's the same with karma. We cannot finesse it, cause and effect, cause and effect. If you chop down a tree, that tree dies. No matter what you wish for, uh, no matter if you, you know, don't want it to, if you do want it to, if you want it to die right now, if you want it to die later, you can't finesse it. It's going to die. All right. It's the same with karma. Okay. So that's one point. It's, there's no mercy. So that's why we have to be careful. Okay. The other thing I want to say about karma, as I said earlier, is that it exists in the conscious, not an outside force. So what does that mean? Okay. Um, if karma existed as an outside force, it would not, uh, let's say, it, it would not go from one lifetime to the next, okay? It's, it exists um, in the, what's called the alaya, which is a very subtle uh, form of our consciousness, okay? So it, it's inside of our own mind, all right. And that's why our own actions of body, speech, and mind can um, create, you know, suffering for ourselves or happiness for ourselves. Okay. And that is how also it travels from life to life with us. Okay. And also it is, um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry. So um, we have just a couple minutes before I start meditation. Does anybody have any questions about this before we continue? I'll give you like, I don't know, five seconds or something. If you have a question, just type it in the chat and we can answer questions. Do, 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 do. Nothing. Okay. Um, so there's a lot more to say about karma. Um, really quite a lot. It's a, it's a very interesting and topic, very profound, um, and worth looking into. Um, this book here, which I, uh, I brought with me today, um, is called Words of My Perfect Teacher. Okay. Um, and we're studying this text. We always study this text. Every year we start studying this text. It takes a year. It takes a year to go through it. Okay, with some breaks, like usually we take a month or two in the summer without studying, but other than that, it takes a year, let's say 10 months. Okay, so um, it's very interesting. It, it talks about a lot of different things about the Buddhist path, um, and I recommend it. It's, but I really recommend actually doing a class because there's a lot of foreign concepts in here that um, I think having some explanation for is very helpful. Okay. All right. So I'm going to drink a little bit of water and then we're going to do some meditation. Okay. So we're going to do uh, mindfulness of breathing meditation, which is the first meditation taught by the Buddha. And um, in this meditation, we're going to take the meditation posture and we're going to focus on the sensation of the breath coming in and out of the nose. So our focus is going to be here. 
Okay. Meanwhile, we let the thoughts come and go. So normally what happens is we are, sorry, I keep getting caught on the chair. We're like married to our thoughts and emotions, right? We very strongly uh, identify with them. We think they're real. Uh, we think they have power of their own, that we are like powerless to resist and things like that. This is a totally false belief. Okay. So mindfulness of breathing practice really helps us to realize that, to see that we're not our thoughts and emotions, that we can let them go or we can follow them. We can act on them or not act on them. So once we learn this skill, uh, we can respond to life rather than just reacting to life. And I would venture to say, and this is my own belief, doesn't really come from Buddhism, but it really seems more human, right? To respond, to make a choice rather than just react. Like that's what plants do, right? That's what animals do, they just react. Okay, something happens and they react. Okay, so we want to uh, have more space and more control and more choice about how we react to life, how we think about things, how we can work with our mind. Okay, so when we sit, we're focusing on the breath, we're not trying to stop the thoughts. Okay, it's impossible in any case. You just will frustrate yourself. I hear that a lot actually. People often say to me, oh, I really want to meditate. I really try to meditate, but I can't stop my thoughts. Yes, of course, nobody can, okay? It's not about that. It's about not grasping onto them. It's about just letting them be without engaging. So let me give you an example. So here's what we want to do. We want to take the posture, which I'll explain in a minute, um, focus on the breath, and let's say a thought arises, um, you know, like I texted my sister last night. Yeah, We want to just let that go. That thought will just dwell for a moment in our mind. It will disappear. It will be replaced by another thought, chocolate pie. That will be replaced by another one, Donald Trump. That will be replaced by another one, pandemic, right? And we just let them go. Just let them go. Keep your focus on the breath, all right? That's it. Eventually though, we will get distracted. And that means jumping into the storyline, okay? Really grasping onto a thought, really engaging in it. So here's what we want to avoid. Practicing, watching her breath, okay? And then the thought arises, I texted my sister last night. Then we we're off and running. Oh, why didn't she text me back? What is she doing? Oh, she probably doesn't like me. I remember when we were 12, this and that happened. And oh, my parents, and now they're dead. And blah, 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 blah. We can go hours like that, actually, especially at the beginning. All right. There will come a point where we realize that we got distracted. Okay. At that point, we just go, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be meditating and bring the mind back to the breath. That's it. Doesn't mean to be a doesn't need to be and should not be judgment involved in that. Either judgment of of the thought itself or of ourselves for getting distracted. All right. The worst thought that we could possibly have is still just a thought. The most holy and best thought that we could possibly have is still just a thought. Okay. We just let them go. Clouds and like clouds in the sky. Keep our focus on the breath. All right. So when we get distracted, and I say when and not if, all right, uh, the moment that we realize that we got distracted is not a failure. That is a victory, okay? That is our natural awareness arising, the very thing that we're trying to develop, the very thing we're trying to make more consistent, okay? So that's very cool. Ah, oh, my cool, I realized that I was distracted, bring the mind back, all right? Um, it's important to, to know and to remember that uh, Buddhism starts from the perspective of basic goodness or Buddha nature, that we all have within us all the qualities of enlightenment. 
And the path is a matter of removing obstacles to seeing that truth, okay? So when we are meditating, we shouldn't see it as some exotic practice that flew on a magic carpet from the East, okay? It's a very practical practice, like brushing your teeth or taking a shower or having a cup of coffee. It's not a big deal, okay? It's just working with the mind that we're probably not really used to doing, so it might seem a bit odd. But once we get used to it, it really becomes very natural and extremely helpful, actually, okay? So that's what we're trying to do <laughs> with our mind, and we keep this particular posture to do meditation because it supports the mind in meditation, all right? So if you're sitting in a chair, just put your feet um, flat on the floor. If you're sitting on the floor, just cross your legs in a way that's comfortable for you. It doesn't have to be full lotus or anything fancy, okay? Then uh, all the other instructions are the same. So your hand should be either palms down on your knees, um, like palms up like this in your lap or with your fingers on top of each other and your thumbs touching like that in your lap, all right? Ignore my wonky thumb there. Okay, then your arms should be relaxed. So you're not holding them in, you're not holding them out, just relax. The back is straight. This is the most important thing. Even if you have everything else, um, wrong or whatever, uh, the back should be straight. That's that's it, because all your nerves are running up and down the spine, or not all of them, but um, a lot of the nerves running up and down the spine, connected to the brain, and so forth and so on, okay? So make sure your back is straight. You don't want to be like, like you're in the army, okay, but just straight. So that means that the back of your neck is also straight, so your chin's going to be tucked in. <laughs> Excuse me, tucked in a little bit, like that, uh, like that. Okay, mouth is closed, but relaxed. So you're not closing it like that, or you're not sitting like that. Just closed and relaxed. Tongue resting on the roof of the mouth, breathing through the nose. The eyes should be open, ideally, um, but uh, sort of half open. So if you look straight ahead and you just put your eyes down about halfway, it's a good lowered, relaxed, lowered gaze. All right. So that's it for the posture. Uh, you know what you're doing with the mind. All you're doing is maintaining the posture and trying to keep your focus, your awareness on the breath. You're not trying to stop your thoughts. You're not trying to, you're, you're aware of everything that's happening around you. The sounds outside or, you know, the sensations or wherever you're sitting, you're aware of everything, but you're mainly focusing on the breath, okay? So I'm gonna ring the gong and then just take some time Relax into your body, relax your mind. Bring your awareness to the sensation of the breath, entering and exiting the nose. And just try to keep that awareness steady.
Bring your mind back to the breath. Your body should be as relaxed as possible while maintaining the posture. Your mind should be as relaxed as possible while maintaining awareness of the breath. Don't grasp, just relaxed awareness. Now please begin to count the breaths, counting either every in-breath or every out-breath to a total of 10 breaths. So the reason we do this is because the counting helps us to realize more quickly if we've gotten distracted, right? So as soon as you realize you got distracted or if you realize you got distracted, just bring the mind back, start again at one. If you get to 10, Again, just bring the mind back, start again at one. If you go beyond 10, it's another form of distraction. So as soon as you realize you're at whatever, 15, 20, what have you, uh, oh yeah, I'm so to go to 10, bring the mind back, start again, okay? So please begin that now.
Slow down your mind. Relax as much as possible. Nothing to strive for. Nowhere to go. Just being here and now. Okay, all right, now we have a few more minutes. We are going to do a practice called Tonglen, which means giving and receiving. This practice is meant to uh, really um, recognize and develop our innate compassion for others. Uh, and it involves five steps, um, which I will just go through with you instead of talking about first, because we don't have a lot of time. Um, so to begin this practice, we just want to rest the mind in the natural state, okay? That means we're not distracted, we're not running all over the place. Um, at the same time, we're not actively trying to concentrate on anything, just letting the mind be. That just is going to be a moment. I'm going to ring the gong, listen to the sound as long as you can hear it, and let your mind rest. Okay, now we're going to work with the visualization. So in your heart center, which is in the middle of your chest, visualize a very bright white light, okay? with light going in all directions outside, you know, and hitting through your body in all directions. Now imagine dark gray smoke coming inside, so you breathe in this dark gray smoke through all the pores of your body, and all of it dissolves into the white light in your heart center. Till there's not a single particle of smoke left, there's only light. Now again, breathe out this white light, which is cool, clean, clear, very bright, through all the pores of your body, the light emanating as far as the eye can see. Okay, now we're gonna work with an individual. Typically there's four types of individuals we work with in this practice. Someone we love, someone who's neutral to us, someone we dislike, and ourselves. Today we're gonna to do someone that we love. We haven't done this practice for a while, so. So picture in front of you someone that you love a great deal. This person can be alive or they can have already passed. So go into your heart and really feel that love that you have for them and appreciate the love that they have for you. 
how precious they are to you. How fortunate you feel to have them in your life. Now consider the ways that this person is currently suffering or did suffer while they were alive or while they were in this life. And don't just think about it, but try to really feel it, right? Maybe they're sick or have some other kind of physical dif difficulty. Maybe they're grieving, um, angry, lonely, depressed, whatever it is they're going through. Just think about that. Try to really feel it. And because you love this person so much, their pain becomes your pain. You become, it's unbearable for you how they're suffering. So then imagine that all of their suffering, whatever it is, takes the form of gray smoke. And the smoke is hot in temperature, dark and heavy. And it comes from them and it comes to you and you breathe that in through all the pores of your body. And all of that smoke dissolves into the white light in your heart center. Until there's not a single particle of smoke left, there's only light. Now you're going to offer to this person that you love all of your good fortune and happiness, giving it away. Consider that you're not going to have it anymore. Okay, along with anything at all that they may need to be free of this suffering. And adding to that, the wish that they attain full and complete enlightenment in this very life. Now, all of that takes the form of white light, cool, clean, clear, very, very bright. You breathe that out through all the pores of your body and the light goes towards this person that you love. And when the rays of light touch them, all of their suffering just disappears. And you can see them, their face so relaxed, happy, at ease. And how happy that makes you feel that you've removed the suffering of this person that you love. Now we're going to extend that out towards all sentient beings, imagining them all around us. In front, as many beings as we can imagine, conceive of, all the way to the horizon. To the right, same thing, all the way to the horizon. Behind, as many beings as we can imagine, all the way to the horizon. And to the left, same thing, all the way to the horizon. So now we're surrounded by countless sentient beings. The first thing that we want to do is to consider um, how we're the same, in what way we are the same, which is that each one of us wants to be happy without exception. Each one of us wants to be free of suffering without exception. Yet each one of us suffers to one degree or another. So we want to think about that. And we want to think about our connection to all these beings. The Buddha taught that every single sentient being has at one point or another been our very kind mother, caring for us, loving us, sacrificing for us, but maybe that's not an idea we can accept. That's fine. That's fine. We should also consider our connection to all these beings, right? Um, you know, we couldn't go through a single day without others, honestly. You know, someone built our house or apartment building. Um, there's people who keep the uh, utilities going, um, who make our clothes um, and may grow and ship and sell our food and on and on our glasses, our teeth, you know, everything, everything really relies on others. So we still owe a debt of gratitude to all these beings who enable us to live just day to day. So think about that. And then consider all the suffering that beings are going through some of it incredibly intense. I mean, right now we can think about all the, the poor people who have COVID 
and are in the ICU with this horrible, you know, respirator down their throat, dying alone or being sick alone, their families, and on and on, and so much suffering. So we think of all of that for all sentient beings all around us. And then their suffering takes the form of gray smoke, hot, dark, and heavy. And it leaves all of them and it comes to you without any hesitation. You breathe that in through all the pores of your body, each and every particle of that smoke dissolving into the white light in your heart center until there's not a single particle left. There's only light. Then you offer all of these beings your own happiness, your own good fortune, along with anything at all that they may need to be free of suffering and adding to that the wish that they attain full and complete enlightenment in this very life. Now, all of that takes the form of white light, cool, clean, clear, light in weight, very bright, every single pore of your body emanating a ray of this white light in every direction as far as the eye can see. And when these rays of light touch all sentient beings, their suffering just completely evaporates. They feel so relieved, happy, and joyful. And you feel joyful for being able to do this for them. Now you let go of the visualization altogether, gently bringing the mind back to the breath, awareness back to the breath, being in the present moment, here and now. Okay, so now uh, we are going to say the dedication prayers, which the link is in the doobly-doo. Okay, we're going to say the closing prayers, but we're going to just say one because we're out of time here. Okay, so if you look at the second page, the um, prayer on the top left corner. So before we say this prayer, prayer uh, I want to explain it, okay? So um, this is dedicating the merit, okay? So uh, merit is uh, positive karma, if you want, right? Positive, um, yes, positive karma, virtue. Anything, so anything we do um, that is good, positive, whatever you want to call it, skillful, um, we should dedicate the merit. So again, merit is that. What is dedication? What does that mean? It means that we're taking the, all that positivity, if you want a positive energy, and instead of just keeping it for ourselves, we'll, which will, you know, we've done a good thing, so it will result in happiness for ourselves. Um, we share it with all sentient beings so that it also benefits all of them. And what that does is it seals that positive action also. So it can't be destroyed by our... Um, negative acts. Oh, that's another thing I wanted to say about karma, sorry, is that it's not fate, okay? It's not like, oh, it's my karma to be, you know, whatever, to, to, to have this back pain, and I shall always have this back pain. If I work with it, you know, I can get rid of it. Um, every positive thing we do lessens the negative karma we've created. Every negative thing we do lessens the positive karma we've created. So it's quite um, changeable. It's really in flux all the time. Um, anyway, there's a lot more to say about that, but I wanted to raise that point. So I want to explain this prayer by this merit, which I just explained, may all attain omniscience. So in this case, omniscience, omniscience is a synonym for full enlightenment. 
may defeat the enemy wrongdoing. So that directly refers to karma, right? It's our own wrongdoing that causes us to suffer. So it's the wrongdoing um, that uh, is the enemy, okay? From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. These are considered the four main streams of suffering in the human realm. From the ocean of cyclic existence, so cyclic existence is samsara. It is this round of birth and death and all these forms that we've been trapped on since the beginning of this time. May I free all beings. So again, that's the bodhicitta motivation, but at the end, okay? So we're going to read that once in English, once in Tibetan, and then we'll be done. All right? By this merit, may all attain omniscience, may defeat the enemy wrongdoing. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of cyclic existence, may I free all beings. So nam di tam che si pani, tob ne ne be dra nam pam che shing, ke ga na chi palun tru pa yi, si be so le dro wa dro wa sho. If you want to say that um, Bajrasattva with me, the hundred syllable mantra, which is in the bottom right. Om Vajrasattva Samaya Manupalaya Vajrasattva Tenopa Tishta Dredo Mebawa Suto Kayo Mebawa Supo Kayo Mebawa Anurakto Mebawa Sawa Siddhi Meprayasa Sawa Kala Sutsa Me Chitam Shri Yang Guru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bhagawan Sawa Tatagata Vajrama Mimuta Vajrapa Maha Samaya Sata all right. Well, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Um, I want to make a few announcements before I let you go. Um, this Friday is a very big day in the Buddhist calendar. All of our positive acts are multiplied 100,000 times or more. It's called Chokur in Tibetan, Chokur Duchen. It, it just, it, just it commemorates the um, uh, first teaching of the Buddha after he got enlightened. Uh, so we will be reading a sutra, the the sutra about the four noble truths, which was the Buddha's first teaching, and I'll be talking about those four noble truths as well. It's just an hour uh, from seven thirty to uh, and I'm sorry, from six thirty to uh, seven thirty in the evening this Friday. Um, there's no charge, but you need to register just to get the link because it's going to be on Zoom and not here on YouTube, okay? The next day, and so then that's Friday. Saturday and Sunday, we're going to have a seminar on dealing with uh, difficult emotions. It will include a lot of meditation and um, talking about various skillful means for handling, you know, anger, anxiety, um, things like that, jealousy, and so forth. Okay, so that, that's happening this weekend. Um, and we also have on Sunday, this Sunday, uh, family meditation, which we do the last Sunday of every month. So if you're interested in that, if you have kids and you want to do that, we do a little bit of meditation and then an art project that's led by Miss Michelle. Um, again, that is free and uh, you just need to register to receive the link. Okay. Um, so we really appreciate uh, donations. Um, we do a lot of things for free. This um, Sunday, regular first three Sundays of the month, um, you know, live stream guided meditation, um, kids meditation, and so forth. Okay, so you know we're not at our center, but we still need to pay rent. We still need to pay utilities and things like that. So if you can help us out, we really really appreciate it. If you can't. We fully understand it's a really difficult time economically for a lot of people. So I don't want you to feel pressured, but I want to let you know we do need donations if you can manage, okay? Links below. All right. So thank you again for joining us, joining me. I really, really appreciate it. And um, I hope to see you Friday and the weekend. <laughs>